Hi there. My name is Gabriel Koslovsky. I'm a Brazilian architect and curator. I'm here because the Amazon is burning. Uh, people are dying from COVID-19 and our democracy is being challenged. Let me show you how I'm trying to address these issues through the power of maps. I'm going to use contemporary Brazil as a case study, but we can extrapolate this discussion to any other place we want. Two years ago, alongside three extremely talented architects, I curated the exhibition of the Brazilian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. This is the oldest and most renowned event in our field, in which countries from all over the world gather to display some aspects of their most contemporary architecture production and thinking. We thought we had the responsibility of not only displaying existing work, but of creating new content, of advancing knowledge about Brazil. For that, we launched a research project to better understand the spatial consequences of the urbanization this country went through over the last decades. Or put it in other words, to understand the physical imprint that urbanization processes have left in that territory. We elected 10 themes that we thought were in urgent need of discussion, such as the political border of the country in relation to our indigenous lands, the encounters between human and natural ecosystems, the flows of people through immigration, or the flows of materials through the movement of commodities, how capital is specialized throughout national regions, and many more. Each theme would eventually become a map that not only discussed urbanization, but went a step further to make visible the walls, the barriers that have built this country, both the physical and the immaterial walls that prevent Brazil from establishing a more egalitarian and democratic public sphere. To make something visible through the process of mapping then became a way to denounce spatial and political decisions that would otherwise go unnoticed. The act of seeing then becomes the first step to work on our problems, the process of acknowledging they exist so we can move towards acting on them. We call this exhibition Walls of Air, alluding to these conceptual and ideological walls, the walls of air, that separate us that create ruptures within our society, but also to the process of dematerializing something material, of turning a wall into air. Then the question became, given the 10 themes that we wanted to break down to discuss these walls, how could we ever make sense of and deal with such complexity and range of topics in the only five months that were given us before the exhibition? To answer this question, the first wall we decided to break was that separating architecture from other disciplines, and these disciplines between themselves. We convened more than 200 professionals and institutions from 10 different disciplines, and we put together a multidisciplinary committee with some of the greatest minds in their fields. The result of this collaboration became the 10 maps, but also 21 essays, 11 interviews, a book, a newspaper, a short film, and four exhibitions. Venice, Rome, Beirut, and New York City. Let me walk you through two of these maps and go further to show how they're helping fight COVID-19 today. The first one is called Fluid Landscape, and it explores a clash between human and natural ecosystems. This is a map of South America, entirely painted in blue from data of atmospheric humidity we got from NASA's website. The bigger the intensity of the blue, the bigger the humidity levels. You can see that over the Amazon forest, the humidity reaches its higher levels, but you can also see that there is a tongue of blue that travels to the southeast of Brazil, which is where our biggest and most prosperous cities are. To understand this phenomenon, we looked at the wind regime and plotted an average of the yearly wind pattern through millions of white arrows corresponding to the direction and intensity of the wind. So you can see that wind is pulled from the Atlantic Ocean. This is because of the low pressure that is created out of evaporation over the forest. It travels to the interior of the continent, carrying that humidity, hits the mountain chain of the Andes, and is redirected towards the southeast of Brazil, where the humidity is dissipated. This travel of large quantities of water through air currents has a name. It's called the Flying Rivers. 
And one of the leading experts in this study is the famous agronomist Antonio Donato Nobre, who opened our eyes to this process. You've got to check his TED talk. So being able to see this process showed us that the north and south of Brazil are intrinsically connected to an environmental phenomenon that happens at a continental scale. The wealth of the south and the very possibility of prosperous and abundant way of life depends on our forests up north. But our country decided to burn them. In a partnership with the Global Forest Watch, we mapped all deforestation spots. The gradient from yellow to red show us the carbon emissions through deforestation, representing the intensity of it. We are destroying the most biodiverse of our forests, upon which the climate of the world depends. But even if you just cared about making money on our big cities, your life is also in the line. Sao Paulo is already experiencing droughts and rising temperatures and is increasing each time more. But last year showed us that we could no longer turn away from this problem. The moment our pseudo-fascist administration took power, deforestation and illegal fires got their green light, to the point it could be seen from space. And in August 19th, they became night. This is Sao Paulo during the day, and here the scientific evidence tracking the hot smoke. We could now feel viscerally with our senses what we were mapping with our computers a year ago. Last month, a similar tragedy was felt in the US. The smoke of wildfires engulfed California. I took this aircon photo with my phone from my window in the opposite coast of the US, in Boston. For four days, the sky was completely blocked in a homogeneous, thick layer of smoke, which could be explained by the wind currents and how they dissipated this smoke. These are a couple of examples that help us see the connection between things and hopefully contribute to a broader process of breaking the isolation of our minds, of ourselves with strangers, between our neighborhoods and cities and among our nations. So we understand that our life decisions will invariably impact someone else's. The second map is called the Maps Not the Territory. This is a map that challenges the usual common sense on how we depict countries by an abstract line that carries zero information besides where one country legally starts and another one ends. This is because the reality on the ground is usually nothing close to that line on the paper, meaning that the map you see does not represent the actual territory. Here, we wanted to show the materiality of that line. The map illustrates the many layers that form the actual Brazilian border. Red lines represent the possible routes, either travel by road, rivers, or air, in which it's possible to arrive and travel as close as possible to the official political border. It demonstrates the difficulty and sometimes impossibility of accessing that border, exposing how existing barriers occur much before the drawn line. The border becomes a zone, and we replace the meaningless line by other factors that define the on-the-ground experience of those places, such as the intersection between biomes and bodies of water, border patrol stations, twin border cities and urban agglomerations, indigenous reserves, demographic data, environmental protection areas, and so on, that reflect the different degrees of permeability of that border zone. To create this map, we talked with indigenous leader and intellectual Ayuton Krenak, a key figure in Brazil who was responsible for including the protection of indigenous rights in the National Constitution of 1988. For Ailton, we have to deconstruct the narratives of fixed, self-contained worlds propagated by figures such as the current presence of the US and Brazil. Because this gets imprinted in our minds, forming mentalities and making society hostage of its own isolation. The concept of borders does not exist for indigenous communities, and the imposition and demarcation of indigenous reserves is also a form of state violence. However, we see that these reserves are now pockets of hope. Here you see the red marking the areas of deforestation, and the orange marking the limits of indigenous lands. They are the only places that forests are surviving, and our government is doing everything in its power to dismantle such reserves, destroy indigenous communities, and open ground for the agribusiness. Walls of Air had an extremely generous reception. And when part of the show was about to open in Peru, 
COVID-19 hit the world and the show was put on hold. The COVID crisis though, it made me realize that we should use our collective intellectual ability to reflect together on the changes to come, as well as to imagine the future we want. At the same time, that we needed to invent new forms of solidarity and help those most impacted by the virus. Together with some amazing people, I created an initiative called Tomorrow Anew to collect thoughts on our future and to channel donations to those who need help to survive the pandemic. I established partnerships with several NGOs who are helping the indigenous peoples of the Xingu and families living in precarious conditions in the slums of Sao Paulo in partnership with Instituto Bay. We're helping the Quilombola and Riverside communities of the Amazon in partnership with Brazil Foundation and the Conservation International Brazil and families hit hard by the pandemic and the economic crisis in the US and in Kenya in partnership with Give Directly. The peoples of the Amazon, however, are struggling so hard to survive the pandemic. Imagine, many of them are part of native indigenous communities who are especially vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19 due to their low immunity to viruses, their collective traditional ways of life, and their limited access to health services. Their chances of contracting and dying from the virus is eight times higher than ours. The lack of governmental action is already causing shortages of food and medicine. It has been devastating, and many elder leaders, we call them caciques, have already died. These are cultural and anthropological damages we will never be able to revert. So we are putting some serious focus here. The images you see in the background, for example, were donated by eight generous photographers that are working closely with our partner, Instituto Bay, to help the Xingu. And more, we realized that our maps had already had a good time moving around. And instead of new exhibitions, they could contribute more if they were to be transformed in direct support on the ground. The 10 maps, each telling a different story about Brazil, could now contribute a little bit so other Brazilians could survive and tell their own stories. I am extremely grateful for all the positive feedback and support Tomorrow New has received so far. We've already sold three of these maps, gathered tens of thousands in donations, and received more than 140 reflections about our common future. I invite you to join us. And a fantastic person who has also joined the cause is Turkish media artist Rafik Anadol. Building on the power of cartographies, Rafik is supporting our campaign by creating a visualization of COVID-19's global development. Based on the data set from the healthmap.org and the John Hopkins University, the 3D map depicts the millions of confirmed cases as of June 2020, as well as the path tracking and timeline of the spread of the virus. This data was processed to determine the cumulative sum filtered by continent, country, province, and city, in which every variable can be isolated and cross-referenced with any other. Because of the way it was programmed, data can be easily updated as new reports become available. The piece encourages us to merge our global intellectual resources to reach a more comprehensive understanding of our current moment and to imagine a post-pandemic world where global interconnections will be instrumental for our collective healing process. I would like to conclude by restating that maps are never neutral, and because of that, they can be used as powerful political tools to denounce conditions that our systems and governments want to hide. By making certain conditions visible, we can empower groups that are being silenced. We can make action inevitable, since complex problems become easy to understand when they are translated into images that our memories can retain. An image can hold thousands of words and millions of numbers, making it more difficult to pretend they don't exist. I invite you to read maps differently and create your own versions to highlight the problems that are important for you and your community, because your problems are everyone's problems. Similar to what we were discussing before about the environment, everything is interconnected. Thank you very much.